All right. Well, good morning. Now, I've been having some conversations off and on with some of you about the uh, uh, second half of your life, third, third of your life, or the last third of your life, and okay, uh, we go through all of these different transitions, and somehow we get it in our mind that when we get to a certain point of life, we're done. Uh, but that's that nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I've heard uh, many people that have retired said, you know, this is I'm just getting my second wind here in the uh, second part of my life. And I was thinking about that, look, looking at the uh, material we're going to be looking at this morning. It's been a long time since I've done one of these. And I've had this song in my uh, mind uh, for a while now. And so I thought I'd go ahead and do a hymn story lesson uh, this morning. And uh, the guy that wrote the song we're going to be looking at this morning actually had at least three different careers in his life. And uh, his name was uh, Aaron Wesley Dykus. And most people just referred to him as A.W. Uh, seems like a lot of people back in those days went by their initials, A.W. Dykus. And um, he, um, he was a, a man of deep faith all of his life. And... Uh, he was born in Missouri in 1888, grew up in Indiana, and attended a gospel meeting at one point. And at that gospel meeting, um, and if you don't know what a gospel meeting is, another word for that is revival, okay? Uh, a visiting preacher came in and preached gospel sermons and uh, hoping people would obey the gospel and put on uh, Christ, accept Christ as Lord, and put him on in baptism. And uh, his son wrote this about his conversion. He said he was converted from a denominational faith with which he had become quite dissatisfied. And being a man of extremely high moral principles, he was delighted to find a religious body that subscribed to the Bible and the Bible alone. This was particularly appealing to his analytical scientific mind. After he got married, his father-in-law must have saw something in him because he encouraged him to go and, and preach. And that year he made a vow to God that if the Lord will allow me to get an education, I will use it in service to him. And he remained true to that vow his entire life. He actually preached his first sermon in 1913, and he preached his first revival, his first gospel meeting in 1915. In 1912, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Marion Normal College, and I don't know if you ever heard of a normal college before, but that's what they used to call teachers' colleges. You train people to become teachers. So he earned his BS degree from Marion Normal College, and then in 1925, he was offered an, a, a student instructor scholarship to the University of Indiana, uh, which helped pay for some of his school expenses, but he continued to preach on weekends wherever possible. And the money that he earned from preaching helped to pay for expenses that the scholarship did not cover. So he wound up earning his A.B., his M.A., and Ph.D. degrees, all from Indiana University. Taught in several high schools for several years, and eventually became a professor of science at the University of Indiana. Then in 1930... He moved to Cookville, Tennessee to become the professor and head of the Department of Physics at Tennessee Polytechnic Institute, or Tennessee Tech. And he was there for 20 years, and he had some uh, impressive uh, work that he had done. He was, a, he was a president of the Tennessee Academy of Science, a member of the Southern Association of Physicists, and a member, a member of Sigma... Um, how do you say that? Uh, X-I. I don't know how you say that. X-I. Uh, anyway, um, I know how to say it in Greek, but I know there's another way to say it. Um, but anyway, that was a National Scientific Honorary Society. In the 1940s, he became heavily involved in training graduates for nuclear studies in connection with Oak Ridge National Laboratories. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, and one of his uh, students, his former students, who was also an atomic scientist, said this about him. He said that A.W. Dykus probably had more of his students at Oak Ridge than any other physics professor. I was one of those, he says. After doing atomic research at Columbia University in New York, I came to Oak Ridge and hired probably more than half of his former students there, including one of his sons. And his sons was... Uh, Part of the an integral part of the team on the Manhattan Project during World War II. 
Uh, he had various talents. He invented an automobile signal in 1920 and actually got a patent for it. It was manufactured for a little while until the patent had expired. Um, he invented an elect electric pencil sharpener, an automobile speed governor. So if you get irritated by those, you can blame him. <laughs> he invented a, a skill saw. And in the, in the midst of all of that, he still continued to preach. In fact, there is a bill from one of the uh, lessons that he preached while he was also a professor there at the uh, university. Well, in his later life, he changed careers. In the 1940s, he, became the, uh, he moved to, to Florida to become the academic dean for a new college known as Florida Christian College, uh, a new college that was associated with Churches of Christ, later changed their name to Florida College. And he set up a, an academic, academic program, helped to set up an academic program that helped the college to gain admittance to the Southern Association and become um, accredited in a very short period of time. And he worked at this uh, college until his retirement in 1954. One of his uh, former students uh, wrote this about uh, Brother Dykus. He said, he writes, Brother Dykus had a distinct independence about him. His convictions ran deep. Sometimes he appeared stubborn. He enjoyed a good argument. He possessed one trait, however, on which many preachers seem short. He would not fall out with someone who did not see eye to eye with him. This writer met A.W. Dykus in 1950. I was a student at Florida Christian College when he became dean. One day I walked into his office with a problem to me that was very serious. I fully expected to be treated as a statistic. And much to my surprise, he, he was warmly interested. He was a man with a heart. He exercised the powers of his deanship to work out a solution to my academic problem. And for the past 10 years, he listened to me preach week after week. Seldom did he leave the meeting house without some word of encouragement. Occasionally, he would call on the phone to express appreciation for some point in a lesson. I have never had a more appreciative listener. He loved the word of God and was thrilled to hear it preached. He was able to be in attendance on Sunday mornings, though feeble and nearly blind until a few weeks before his death. Bill Humble, the uh, church historian, wrote this about Brother Dykus. He said, Through the years that I worked under Brother Dykus, he was a great source of strength and inspiration. And as a young, inexperienced teacher, I could go to him for counsel and encouragement. But I remember Brother Dykus as more than a distinguished physicist turned college dean. I remember him as a disciple of Christ, a man of deep faith, a man who expressed that faith in song. And after uh, Dykus uh, retired from Florida College in 1954, he went into full-time preaching for various churches in Florida. And he wrote several Christian books during that time, a book of sermon outlines. He wrote a commentary on Hebrews and a commentary on Romans and a book on church leadership. And also during that time, he took up writing songs as a hobby. And in fact, he wrote more than 35 songs. And um, in 1978, he passed from this life at the age of 90. And probably his most well-known song <clears throat> is, Our God, He Is Alive. It was published in 1966, uh, appeared first in this hymn book. I don't know if you've ever seen this one before, Sacred Selections. And at first it was one of those, you know, you used to be able to get those gum sheets and uh, those sheets and paste them in the back. And that's how it first appeared until they finally started printing them in the back cover of Sacred uh, Selections. Um, but most of us probably remember it as 728B in Alton Howard's hymnal, uh, uh, Songs of the Church. In fact, I remember uh, several years ago at the Tulsa International Soul Winning Workshop, uh, there was a, a minister that had come there from Southeast um, uh, Christian Church in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. That was the year they were uh, they had uh, talk about our common heritage back in the, back in the day. But uh, anyway, he said, "I keep hearing about this 728B," and he had never heard it before. He said, uh, "I really would like to hear the 728B," and that was back in the days when the uh, 
Zoe group was uh, leading singing, and interestingly, they didn't know it well enough to lead it. So they did it the old-fashioned way, and they found a song leader in the audience and brought him up. We didn't have songbooks anymore. In the early days of Tulsa, every year, uh, Howard Publishing was there, and there were songbooks in all of the seats, and a lot of people would buy them and bring them back home uh, for their churches. But uh, they quit using songbooks at this point. But everyone in that uh, stadium could sing this song from memory and raise the roof. And a lot of people that were there from Southeastern and other uh, Christian churches remarked afterwards, you know what, that's the way worship should be done. They were really impressed by the level of participation of the people that were uh, in attendance there. 728B, look at the verses to this song. Um, Oh, that's the picture that was supposed to go with talking about Tulsa. (laughs) Um, There is beyond the azure blue... A God concealed from human sight, he tinted the skies with heavenly blue and framed the world with his great might. God is there. God is beyond our sight. He is not of this creation. He is the the creator. And even though you can't see God face to face, you can see all of the results of his handiwork. There has been no greater artistry, no greater engineering than what God has created in the creation. There was a long, long time ago a God whose voice the prophets heard. He is a God that we should know who speaks from his inspired word. God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Elijah. God spoke to many prophets. But today he still speaks to us in his inspired word. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's God's message to us. He speaks to us in his words, and so therefore we can know God through his word as well. Secure is life for mortal mind. God holds a germ within his hand, and though men may search, they cannot find, for God alone does understand. I think it's no uh, surprise that man is not God. Oh, we can do a lot, or so we think, right? We've invented all kinds of things. We understand more about uh, the world around us probably than we ever have. But one thing we cannot do, one thing man has not been able to do, is create life. Man has tried. You realize that that there's been uh, attempt after attempt after attempt to create life. And, uh, but God is the one that holds that germ of life in his hand. And even though we may try to understand, there are certain things we're never going to understand because they come uh, from God and are created by God who is eternal. Our God who was who sent upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set man free and evermore with him uh, could live. This is the heart of the Christian message. All of us without Christ would be lost in bondage to our sin. Jesus said in John chapter 8 that when you sin, you become a slave to sin. That's why one of my go-to illustrations for sin is like a fly trap or any kind of trap. Once you sin, you're stuck, you become a slave to sin, and the only hope is for someone who is not himself stuck to come and rescue you. And that's what Jesus does. That's why he goes on to say, but if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. In other words, you will truly be free. You won't just feel free, you will be truly free. And that's what he set out to do when he came from heaven to earth and died on the cross and rose up from the grave. And then the refrain is this, there is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man, he is our God, the great I am. Our God is not dead, our God is alive, and all you have to do is look at the world around us to be reminded of that. Uh, he, had, he has created us and he sustains us. The Bible says that in him all things hold together. Everything works because God is alive. He is the great I am. And that reminds us of what God said back in uh, Exodus chapter 3 when Moses asked him for his name. 
And my, his name, he says, is I am. He is the great I am. Not I was, not I will be, but God is. I am with you, Jesus said, didn't he? He's always with us. You know, there's a couple of encouraging things to remember in thinking about this song. First of all, this song was written by a brilliant scientist. You know, those who claim that only unintelligent, unenlightened people are religious are not telling the truth. Here was a brilliant man, among many other that were brilliant, that had brilliant minds, who uh, believed deeply in God. A brilliant nuclear physicist who looked in the microscope and saw evidence of God everywhere he looked. And you can see that when he writes his song. He sees evidence of God everywhere. And uh, his scientific mind began with God and ended with God. And I was thinking about something else. This song was written in 1966. Do you realize what was going on during that time in, in the 60s? It was written, he wrote this song in the middle of the God is Dead movement. And uh, the death of God movement was in full swing in the 60s. Many rejected the idea of God. They were too enlightened uh, for the God hypothesis. But Dicus, the brilliant scientist, praises the God who engineered the entire universe. No one else could have engineered the universe in the way that God has. Do you realize a lot of our so-called inventions weren't uh, original thoughts? Do you realize that? Whether, whether it's the airplane, uh, you realize the airplane was, you know what they modeled the airplane after, right? Natu yeah, birds. Yeah. So a lot of what was invented are, are copies of the original that God had designed and uh, engineered. Oh, you know what? No one may remember A.W. Dicus's work as a professor or as a scientist or as a nuclear physicist. But I believe that we will remember his work in song for many, many years to come. I found this that was written by his uh, granddaughter, uh, Phyllis, his oldest granddaughter. And she writes about uh, one of the times she was visiting her grandfather. And she says, as, as I was enjoying dinner with him one day, he stopped the meal to pronounce a special blessing Onto the daughter I was then expecting. She was my second daughter and I believe his third great-grandchild. He spoke of the importance his children and their children would be to him and how important they would all be in helping to spread God's word. I have lived long enough now to see that truth, she writes. But she goes on to say that during that visit, he also gave me permission and charged me with the honor and the duty to help spread the good news of Christ by learning and singing correctly the songs he had written with uh, the group, uh, Christian, group of Christian singers I've been privileged to sing with through the years. And I quote, here's what he said, It will be your duty, my oldest grandchild, to learn these songs correctly, sing them as a group, and to teach others. Now, realizing his time left wasn't long, and it was my honor to sit with him in his den and sing as he croaked out the tenor notes to teach me the beautiful harmonies he had so tediously been inspired to write down. So here was a scientist with a song. Here was a scientist with a message that has been preserved and passed down to us to continue uh, even to this day. And so let's go ahead and uh, prepare to, to sing this particular song. And as we sing... Think about what it is uh, we're saying as we sing the words of this song. And remember that our God, not only is he alive, he has been and continues to be intensely involved in our lives, in the lives of humankind. That's why Jesus came from heaven to earth. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he was buried and rose up from the grave uh, so that you could find a means of redemption through him. Uh, to God uh, by, through the forgiveness of your sins. And if you have not accepted him as your Lord and as your Savior, and you accept that he died on the cross for your sins, then you're ready to go down into the water and be born again. And he will wash away all of your sins. And if you've already done that, then think about the words to this poem, to this song, and be instructed and encouraged by it as we uh, stand and sing.